Let me get my screen shared up again. And there we go. So again, welcome to the 2023 HOA only, just to be clear, like Jeff was, uh, board certification course. Uh, like Jeff mentioned, I am in the firm's Orlando office, which I manage. We do have offices in Pompano, Palm Beach, uh, Palm Beach Gardens to be more specific, and also in Tampa, uh, as well as Miami by appointment only. The firm has 21 lawyers. We all practice in the area of community association law. Nine of the attorneys are actually board certified in this area of law. And then we also have one who's also board certified in construction law. Uh, we also have several circuit and county certified mediators, including myself. And that's something that I really enjoy adding to the firm now that I've come back. Um, so bottom line, we're, we're glad to present this seminar for your education. If your community ever needs legal representation, we hope you'll think of us. Uh, but again, as Jeff mentioned, nothing that I can say today will be legal advice because that kind of requires a little bit more in-depth knowledge and frankly, review of your particular circumstances, facts, and governing documents. So uh, without further ado, we've got a ton of information to get through uh, and hopefully in less than the hour and 55 minutes I've got left to do it. So let's go ahead and get started. Association board member certification, why are you here? Well, there are two options of how you can be certified as a director in an HOA in Florida. Uh, you chose the right one, in my opinion. This course is a better, safer way of basically determining that you are certified and have certified that you have at least some basic knowledge of how you're supposed to be operating and maintaining your community. Um, and frankly, let's be honest, you get to hang out with me for two hours instead of doing whatever else it was you would have been doing, which let's be real. I mean, it couldn't have been as exciting as this, right? Anyway, um, 90 days after being elected, the law basically says you need to either uh, enter a certificate into the association's records. You deliver it to the secretary or if you've got a property manager to them. And it, it will say, well, I have read and understood and I intend to enforce the governing documents and, and the Florida statutes. Well, here's reality for you. Um, the governing documents are probably drafted awfully unless someone, including our firm, has cleaned them up for you. Um, they conflict internally. They conflict with other documents in the Florida statutes. So honestly, most community association attorneys, and especially real estate attorneys or other attorneys who don't practice in this area as their main focus, probably can't interpret them properly either. Why would you be expected to? You may be an attorney, you may not, but you know, frankly, most people don't have the expertise to do what it is we do on a daily basis. Often we can't even discern a concrete answer from your governing documents. And so why would you be expected to be able to do that? So um, rather than do that, um, you can be here instead. Um, these certificates are good for the duration of your tenure on the board, meaning that if you come off even temporarily and come back on, you probably got to take this class again or sign that certification. Um, the, another reason that I recommend this class, which obviously I'm preaching to the choir, uh, but the reason that I recommend this class to all of your other directors over going ahead and signing that document is that I've actually seen it used against directors who signed a certificate saying, oh yeah, I've read the documents. I understand them. I'm going to uphold them. Um, no, probably not. Uh, that's been used against them in court where the opposing attorney that, that was opposing the association basically killed that director's credibility by saying, you don't understand these documents at all, do you? And asking questions to prove that. So um, you can certify up to one year in advance. It's good until you are off the board and then you start over. Okay, um, HOAs in general, HOAs are a creature of common law, not statute. So whereas a condo is really a creature of statute, meaning it didn't exist until the condo statute existed, these HOAs are really just a set of covenants that govern a physical area of space. Um, your Declaration of Covenants and Restrictions is not a title document. MARTA affects the recorded covenants. We'll get into what that means later on. Uh, the common areas are generally owned by the association in the association's name. So if your members say, well, I own this common area. No, you don't. And a corporation owns it. And that corporation, through its board of directors, gets to decide what to do with it except for in limited circumstances where the members get to vote on that. Um, 
Again, material alterations can be made unilaterally by the board, meaning you can change the appearance or the use of certain things within your community without a member vote. Um, unless the declaration says otherwise, your elections are held however set forth in the bylaws. A lot of this stuff is duplicative. I'm just going to go ahead, frankly, and move on. Um, I think that most of this is going to be covered later. You know, the, the certification we'll go back to it doesn't have to be repeated as long as you stay on the board um the certificate needs to be retained for five years after the director is elected or and and keep in mind that means if you're only on the board for two three years if you're still on the board that certificate needs to be in the association's official records and if you don't file the written certification uh or I'm sorry, let's skip that. But the one more thing I'll mention is if you're suspended, not just if you come off the board, um, that suspension is automatic. So you're suspended automatically if you have not completed this class or signed that other type of certificate. So keep in mind, this is not something the board gets to decide. It's not something that you can question. It just happens. All right. So moving along, uh, there's a lot in here. We'll talk about a lot of this later. So we're going to move on. Um, this is just general information, by the way, some of it, it's, it, I'm not putting it into these slides for you guys, just for my enjoyment. It's so that you have a quick reference available really quickly. If you want to just flip through the first few pages, but keep in mind, there's more detail to what was in the last few slides later on in the presentation. But like I said, we're very limited in time. So we're just going to go ahead and move forward. Uh, chapter 720, like I said, before we formally got started here of the Florida statutes governs HOAs in Florida. It's created to basically give statutory recognition to corporations that operate these communities. In other words, it's basically saying, well, we know that these covenants existed, these contracts between the members and the association existed, and between the members existed for a very long time before the statute was put in place. But we're going to go ahead and create a statutory scheme to further regulate what these HOAs are allowed to do and are uh, prohibited from doing. Chapter 617 of the Florida statutes is also important, and a lot of people, including attorneys, don't realize this. That not-for-profit chapter of the uh, Florida statutes is actually still governing unless there's a conflict between those two statutes, in which case chapter 720, the HOA specific statute is going to govern over the not-for-profit statute. But keep in mind, you know, a lot of people will ignore that statute. Again, even attorneys, that 617, the not-for-profit statute, it is very relevant. And frankly, it provides some opportunities for the association that you wouldn't have anywhere else except in that chapter. So uh, make sure you're aware that that's something that should be reviewed. Make sure your attorney is aware if they're somehow not aware that that chapter should be ap applied uh, in, in any situation where the HOA Act and your governing documents are silent. That's another place to look if you're trying to accomplish something and those two things are silent. And again, I'm going to speak pretty quickly uh, I would apologize, but unfortunately, I just don't have a choice given the fact that we have 154 slides to get through, which is less than a minute per slide. So that's why some of these were just kind of kind of speed through. Um, this one's important. So contract law 101, the law in effect at the time of the contract and that substantive law, meaning governing the party's um, rights and responsibilities when that contract was formed. In other words, when the declaration was recorded initially. Not amendments necessarily, unless there's specific language called Kaufman language in your declaration that says that it incorporates changes in the statute from time to time. Okay, unless that language is there, the the law that is in existence as of the date of the declaration is grafted into the contract as though it was actually written into the contract. Okay, and this is because the U.S. and Florida constitutions protect us from retroactive application of laws that adversely affect a contractual right that already exists. That's basically what the rest of this note says. Okay, again, Kaufman language. If the declaration does say that it's subject to the statutes as they're amended from time to time, then each year's legislative changes generally apply as if the recent changes were drafted into the declaration. In other words, rather than going back to the year that the, the declaration was recorded, we're going year by year as to what the statutes say. If the declaration doesn't include that language, then you gotta ask, does the legislation itself say whether it's retroactive? 
Okay. Generally, if it doesn't say that, then it's not retroactive. It's just prospective, meaning it only applies from the date that it's adopted and enacted forward. If not, if the statute is silent, are the changes substantive, meaning that they affect rights and responsibilities, or procedural, meaning does it change the way that the association does business? In other words, does it say that you have to hold this hearing with 14 days notice rather than seven days notice? That's a procedural issue. Okay. Could be deemed substantive, which is why this gets really complicated, because now you have less rights if that timeline goes down from 14 to 7. In other words, I have less time to deal with this issue. Okay. If it's procedural, the change is procedural, then the legislation generally will apply. If it's substantive, more likely or not, more likely than not, that new legislation probably won't apply. Okay. You can't assume that the declaration versus the statute or any particular version of the statute is going to control. So we talked about procedural versus substantive laws. Um, a couple examples of substantive rights, ownership and the common expenses and surplus, right to use common areas, um, a cause of action that's accrued. In other words, someone got hurt on the property. Well, that cause of action accrued and turns into a protected property interest. Okay, so that's a substantive right. We also see, like I mentioned earlier, conflicts between the Declaration, Articles of Incorporation, the bylaws. When that conflict exists, what do you do? Okay, just remember, Declaration, Article, Articles of Incorporation, bylaws. Now, let's talk about what these things are. And I'm going to, before we talk about what they are, I want to mention when you have that type of uh, conflict, what you really need to do is amend the item that is lower on that list, Declaration, Articles, bylaws so that it does conform to the higher item. In other words, you no longer have a conflict. So you do an amendment to whatever is different. Um, but bottom line, declaration, that's what people call the CCNRs. Your covenants, conditions, restrictions might contain easements and other items, uh, but, but that's your big mamma jamma constitution of your community. It's the highest document outside of Florida law and federal laws uh, and certain administrative codes. Okay, it's the contract that binds the members and runs with the land. You're, but basically, the courts are going to presume that this document, because it requires so much to amend, the, the courts are going to presume that anything that's in there is valid unless it's arbitrary or arbitrarily enforced. In other words, whatever you throw in there is probably fine unless the law says you can't have it in there. Okay, the Articles of Incorporation, that's generally going to be a document that's filed with the Secretary of State of Florida. It's going to state the name and purpose of the corporation. In other words, it's a not-for-profit corporation designed or incorporated to operate a community association. Your bylaws, now most people think this controls your day-to-day -day operation. What it really controls is your procedures. It's going to say, you know, what, how, how are the meetings run? What are the directors and officers' duties and responsibilities? And some rights of the association. Now, what's not listed here and is the low man on the totem pole is your rules and regulations, your policies, et cetera, your architectural criteria. These are all really rules and regulations. They're generally board made. They generally don't require member approval. And as a result, the courts are going to give them the least amount of deference compared to the declaration, which generally speaking, unless your declaration is very specific that the board is allowed to unilaterally amend it, uh, the members generally have to vote on that. Same with the articles and the bylaws. So the rules and regulations, all you need is a 14 day notice and a board meeting to change those. It's very easy. So the courts are gonna look at those a lot more closely than what's in your declaration that the members presumably voted on. And presumably at least a majority of your entire membership approved and wanted. Whereas your rules and regulations, if you've got a three member board, that means two people out of your entire community actually wanted this, okay? So bottom line, um, remember declaration, articles, bylaws, rules, and regs, it's in that order, okay? Uh, we're going to get into the real uh, nitty gritty now. Transfer fees and estoppel certificates. Uh, transfer fees are really disfavored under Florida law because they make it harder to sell your property. It's basically a fee that says, well, you know, you're going to sell your property. So in addition to whatever the sale price is, you now need to incorporate this dollar amount that just gets paid to the association. Now, there are, are things that you might want, you know, for example, um, capital contributions and things of that nature. 
Just keep in mind, you got to check with your attorney as to whether any of those charges are authorized under Florida law before you try and charge them. Now, this makes sense. You should be able to basically sell your property free and clear however you want. Just don't tell anyone outside of this webinar, specifically my clients, that I ever said that because obviously they want control to some extent over what can and can't be done and how you can and can't sell property, lease it out, et cetera. Now that's all going to go into your declaration, your rules and regulations, et cetera. And if it's not in there, keep in mind, you might not be able to enforce it even if you try. So, you know, bottom line, you want people to be able to sell their property. Uh, you want it to be marketable because frankly, that increases your property values overall. Now, an estoppel fee, on the other hand, is allowed, and so is any fee payable to a nonprofit or charitable organization for certain activities benefiting the association if, again, the declaration or any covenant authorizes that, okay? That's what this slide says. Now, the estoppel certificate itself, what is it? It's basically a document that tells everyone, here's what's owed on the property, here are the covenant violations against the property, and here's some other information that the statute requires, or frankly, whoever's requesting the estoppel certificate might alternatively require, that you know it, it might be important for purposes of someone that wants to buy into this community and specifically buy this particular property that, that they're asking about. Uh, it is required by the statute that the association respond to that and provide the estoppel certificate. We'll go into that in a minute. Um, it, technically, it's within 10 business days after you receive the request. And anything that's not in the estoppel, the reason this is so crucial is anything that's not in this document, once you provide it to the requestor, uh, you, you can't collect it, you can't enforce it. It's called an estoppel because that essentially is the legal theory behind saying, if you give me information and you give me the implication, here it's an express statement, but if you give me the implication that I'm going to be allowed to do something or basically the conditions on my property are not going to be enforced, even if they're wrong, I should be able to rely on that statement, that implication, whatever it may be, in buying the property and not thinking that I'm going to come, you know, have you come after me for $50,000 in unpaid assessments and 20 covenant violations the second that I step into ownership. Okay, makes sense. Um, as a practical tip with respect to estoppel certificates, if the accounts in collection do not just say what's on the account ledger that the association maintains, because you've probably got additional attorney's fees and costs. And like I just mentioned, if it's not on the estoppel certificate, it is not collectible, which means that if someone closes a sale or refinance of that property in reliance on that estoppel and your attorney's fees and costs, which, you know, they're usually less in a com community association foreclosure action than in any other lawsuit, but I've seen them get up to 20 grand where an owner really adamantly is arguing the foreclosure. And if, if that circumstance arose and the association, the, the board or the manager as applicable didn't get that information from the attorney and included on the estoppel certificate that was relied on, you'd be out of luck. So that 20 grand just disappears as a collectible item, okay? So in other words, the association becomes responsible for that rather than being able to pursue it in court, okay? So we don't want that to happen. So bottom line, have your attorney either complete the financial portion and return it to the person that's gonna send it, send the estoppel out to the person that requested it, or have them prepare a separate document, a payoff or whatever you want to call it, that gets attached to the estoppel certificate and say, see attached in that portion of the certificate itself. Um, it's also notably crucial to handle these as soon as possible, especially get the information to your attorney as soon as possible, because if you get this and it's due within 10 business days, and you know the management company or the board of directors is trying to create the estoppel, you finish it, you send it out, and it says, please contact our attorney for the financial information, but it wasn't sent until business day nine. Well, all of a sudden, that's a rush request for your attorney, but it wasn't when they initially requested it. So you're putting your attorney in a really bad position. So that's that's one issue that I've also seen come up where you know it's business day eight or nine, and suddenly we're getting a request for an estoppel certificate that's due tomorrow, or frankly, in some instances, is past due already under the statute, 
Okay. So, and when I say business days, by the way, because some people might not understand, you've got calendar days, which is the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th versus business days. Meaning if it's a weekend, it doesn't count. If it's a national federal holiday, it doesn't count. You might need to consult your attorney for any other potential holidays. Um, but if, if the federal courts are closed, or it's a weekend, those days generally don't count as business days. So it's not just 10 days, it's 10 business days that you have to provide this. Okay, this is just what information goes into the estoppel certificate. You can review it later. I'm not going to waste your time uh, going through it right now because there's a lot for us to go through. But it's like I said earlier, you know, it's it's dollars and problems is the, the two big um content pieces for the estoppel certificate. Now we get into what fees can be charged. Okay, If you don't provide it within the time provided, in other words, that 10 business days, you don't get to charge anything for the estoppel certificate. Um, you know, and, and as a practical matter, delaying this too long also risks claims that someone lost the sale because they couldn't find out what was wrong with the property or what was owed on. Uh, I've seen that come up several times. And it's, you know, whether that's a valid claim or not depends on the circumstances. But in reality, you don't want your community having to face that kind of potential lawsuit and that kind of potential liability just because you waited a couple of days too long to let someone know what's owed and what's wrong with the property. OK, so back to the fees that can be charged. Um, it's two hundred and fifty dollars, which uh, was just recently increased in July. That can be charged if on the date the certificate is issued, no delinquent amounts are owed to the association. In other words, it's a $0 balance, okay? If there is a delinquency, then you can add $150 to that. Um, if someone needs it on an expedited basis, in other words, within three business days after their request, you can charge another $100. Now keep in mind, your attorney may be charging on top of all this if the attorney is preparing anything more than here's our attorney's fees and costs you can go ahead and add it to your estoppel certificate, okay? That's not the way I'd recommend doing it. It's an option. Um, and then in order to charge the estoppel fee, keep in mind also the uh, authority to charge it needs to be established by written resolution adopted by the board or by a written management contract or a bookkeeping or maintenance contract. So don't just think you have the ability to charge these things automatically. Just spend the the you know 10 minutes at a board meeting to pass a resolution to make sure that you're covered. Um, and we discuss what happens if you deliver this too late, you can't charge a fee for preparation. Now there are different fees if you have multiple parcels that are re being requested at once. This estoppel governs, let's say 18 parcels of land in your HOA. So in that case, you can charge up to 750. Uh, and that keep in mind, this substitutes that 250 charge that doesn't necessarily mean you can't also charge the other ones, okay? Um, so in other words, that's 750 instead of the 250. If it's 26 to 50 parcels, $1,000, again, instead of the 250. 51 to $100, uh, 100 parcels is $1,500, and then more than 100 parcels, which you know that's when you're basically selling most of the community, uh, it's a maximum of $2,500, which frankly, I think these figures are absurdly low. Uh, because you're needing to calculate all of this information, check on the violations, and provide other information for each one of these parcels. But I guess the legislature presumes that if you're buying in this type of bulk, they're probably all either in really good condition or really bad condition, and they're all current or not. So um, bottom line, just keep these figures in mind. If someone, in the rare instance that someone is asking for an estoppel certificate that governs more than one parcel at a time. Okay, if the transaction is not completed and no later than 30 days after that scheduled closing, and keep in mind, they need to tell you when the closing is scheduled for, um, they re the person that paid for the estoppel certificate requests a refund, you do need to send that money back. I've only seen it happen maybe five or six times um, in the last few years, but it definitely does happen where people are smart enough to say, we didn't close, we want our money back. We shouldn't have to pay that. Now, keep in mind, that doesn't mean that it's an association expense. The estoppel fee just gets tacked onto the account for the property in question. Um, and there is statutory fee entitlement, meaning whoever wins a lawsuit governing failure to return those funds, and frankly, regarding estoppel certificates in general, is going to be entitled to recover their attorney's fees and costs under statute. So 
just be careful. Don't mess around with estoppel certificates. They are very easily relied upon in court because you are providing something that is expressly intended for whoever is getting it to rely on. So just keep all this in mind. Again, the fees are adjusted every five years. Um, they were just adjusted in 20, July of 2022. So I don't expect an increase despite any inflation we may see for, again, probably four and a half years now as of the date this is being recorded. Um, the estoppel certificate's good for 30 days or 35 days if you're sending it via mail. I don't know anyone that actually does send them via mail. It's usually either email or fax in my experience. Uh, a mistake or if you get new information allows for an amendment to be made to the estoppel certificate if closing hasn't occurred yet. Um, now, keep in mind, if you amend, you can't charge for the amendment and you also need to provide a new good through date. Now, if you're amending and that new information is, well, they cured the violation that was listed in the original estoppel certificate, I question, and the law is not entirely clear, but it might be risky to do this, whether you can potentially charge another estoppel fee because the information that changed was because of actions taken by the owner. I, I think you'd be putting yourself at risk if you charge this fee. What you may want to do is have another fee tacked on to the account afterwards. But again, that creates issues as well with respect to the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and the Florida equivalent. So I'm not making that recommendation to anyone, but it's something you might want to discuss with your attorney as, you know, well, I heard this is an option, potentially a risky one, but let's talk about it. Okay. Again, that is not advice. That is, hey, it's it's a possibility. Okay. Um, you can charge up to $150 plus the reasonable cost of copies and attorney's fees incurred by the association. If in addition to the estoppel certificate, there is a request for information uh, beyond what's in there for the from the prospective purchaser, lien holders, et cetera, you're a lot of times going to see this in the form of a request from Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and other lenders for an opinion letter and things of that nature uh, from the attorney. Um, there may be other documents that they request that they might be entitled to. Again, that fee up to 150 and presumably that needs to be in a resolution as well, unless it's an attorney's fee or under some other contract. Okay, so we got through one subject. Congrats. Uh, now we talk about the fun stuff, use right suspensions, voting suspensions, and finding what we're talking about here is covenant enforcement. Okay, you can fine or suspend a, a lot's use rights, a parcel's use rights after following this procedure. And the procedure, just to be quick, the board votes to levy the fine or the suspension. There's a 14 day notice of hearing before a separate impartial committee. You Now the question is, do you need to have that impartial committee hold the meeting? And again, this is a hearing. It's basically taking evidence as to whether or not the person violated the covenants and that's really what we're talking about here. Um, did this person violate the covenants? Is it worth the fine or suspension that the board wants um, enacted? And then, you know, the, the question again is, does the statute require that you hold this meeting or just offer to hold it? Attorneys will tell you 50-50 on that issue. So my suggestion for in, in, this, in the interest of risk avoidance is to hold the meeting with that committee that you are required to have, an, an impartial committee, uh, if the committee doesn't approve the fine or the suspension, that's the end of it. You can't levy it. You can't levy the fine. You can't suspend the use rights. If they approve, it's effective once the board gives notice of uh, the fine or suspension. Okay, again, this committee must be impartial. Okay, it needs to be made up of at least three members of the community appointed by the board that are on officers, directors, or employees of the association, or those people's spouses, parents, children, or siblings. Okay, so this can be tough to find, but it's something that's necessary if you want to actually have the right to find or suspend use rights under these statutes. Now, as to finding in particular, candidly, I'm not a huge fan, and here's the reason. Um, they're almost never pursued in court. In other words, it just kind of sits uh, it's it's an outstanding obligation. It's allegedly a debt. It sits on the owner's account, so to speak, for however long it takes for that owner 
to either wait the five years when the, the debt expires under the statute of limitations, statute of limitations, sorry about that. I've been talking a lot already. Uh, or the owner goes to sell or to refinance their property. It gets listed on an estoppel certificate. And it's the first thing that the association is going to be willing to waive when the owner inevitably asks the association to say, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll cut this a little bit just to help you get this closed. Um, the association and, and specifically this committee that I mentioned also serves kind of as judge, jury, and executioner. It's, it, they kind of serve the judge's role in saying yay or nay after an evidentiary hearing that the owner presents whatever evidence they have, the association through the board does the same. So, you know, judges don't necessarily love fines, especially when they are collected as an assessment, which you can do under certain circumstances, presumably. Now, I say presumably because the statute says that you can't exceed $100 per violation unless the governing documents say so, and it's ongoing in nature. You can't exceed 1000 per violation in the aggregate, meaning in total for that violation, unless the governing documents say otherwise. So I actually have one where it's been $100 a day uh, in a community in South Florida. This was several years ago, but it ended up reaching about $60,000 between four violations. Uh, that is possible. And a fine of $1,000 or more Technically, we we say it may become a lien. The statute actually says it can't become a lien unless it's $1,000 or more. So we take that as an implication, not necessarily an express statement, but an implication that a fine of $1,000 or more may become a lien against the parcel. And then you can foreclose for those fines if, again, the authority to do so is provided in the declaration. Okay, but keep in mind what you're doing here and how a judge might perceive this. This is telling someone, well, you left your trash out for, you know, five days, six different times. And so in the aggregate, you reached over a thousand dollars. So now we're going to foreclose your house because you didn't put your trash cans away or your recycling bins. You didn't paint your mailbox. It's things like that that we're talking about. So unless it's really egregious, I mean, the, the problem is you have to be consistent and uniform across the board as to how you enforce. My strong suggestion, have a, uh, an enforcement policy in place. If you don't have one, I strongly recommend putting one in place. Um, I won't say that's legal advice, but it's about as close as I'm going to get during this webinar uh, because it's really important that your owners know exactly what's going to happen and that you're going to follow through on these things. Again, the reason I don't like fines is because no one ever follows through on them. I won't say no one ever, but in reality, I very, very, very rarely, uh, I believe, and, and I was, let's see, I started in the collection arena for community associations in 2010. And I didn't really step away from that until about five months ago when I rejoined the firm. And during the, what is it, I guess, 12 years, 13 years that I was doing uh, collection as my primary focus, I don't think I saw more than three or four times where an association was actually pursuing fines in court. So that's why I say it just doesn't happen. Um, and, and that can kill the board's credibility, which you obviously want to build instead. Um, it, it leads people to basically say, well, they can find me all they want. They're not going to do anything about the fact that I'm not paying it. Now, if you're going to do something about it, then yeah, absolutely use every tool that you have at your disposal. Uh, but if your plan is to, well, we're, we're just going to find them and you know we'll, we'll let it sit for a while and they'll know that that's outstanding. They don't care. I hate to be blunt. People don't care that fines are outstanding unless and until you actually do something about it, including what we'll talk about in a minute, which is suspending use rights or voting rights due to an outstanding obligation. Um, now, the fine is due five days after the date that the committee meeting says, yep, we, we agree. You should be fining these people. Let's go forward. OK, use right suspensions for failure to pay. Again, if you are delinquent in any monetary obligation, including fines, owed to the association for more than 90 days, the board at a board meeting can suspend the right of an owner or whoever else may be otherwise entitled to use common elements, common facilities, common areas, or any other association property. Now, keep in mind when I say any other association property, there are specific things that you can't affect, okay? Um, we'll get into those in just a minute, but uh, the bottom line is you can suspend use rights in, let's say, um, the gym, the pool, 
things of that nature. If someone is 90 or more days delinquent in payment of an assessment or any other obligation. Now the motion can be done one time if it's done properly, done at a properly noticed board meeting, but you might want to do it that way. Um, and, and when I say one time, I mean, uh, you've got 20 different properties that you're moving to suspend. Uh, and when I say you might not want to do it that way, it's because you're kind of putting these people on blast and, and you have uh, limitations on how you can refer to properties as delinquent. You can't put out what we call a deadbeat list. You can't, you know, basically put a list together of here are the scumbags that haven't paid their assessments this year, et cetera. So just keep all that in mind. Another avenue that we didn't mention here is a rent demand. If someone is, is uh, delinquent, it, you don't have to necessarily wait the 90 days. I don't think and I'd have to look at the statute to recall, uh, but it's sorry, it's not in my notes, but um, you, you'd you have to um, know that the owner is delinquent. And if they do, you send a, a demand to the tenant that they pay their rent directly to the association going forward and until that account is no longer delinquent or there is no further monetary obligation. And the tenants protected under the Florida statutes in the HOA statute from the landlord coming after them if they pay their rent to the association. That is directly stated in the notice that you'll send, which is a statutory form notice. Okay, the tenant's generally gonna be the one with money to pay you though. So the question is whether you wanna kick them out or not. So this really works well in areas where there are a ton of rentals and the, land, the landlord, the owner is gonna have to keep going back and finding new tenants every time that you kick one out. Now, when I say kick one out, I mean, you're spending two to $3,000 or whatever you're paying your attorney on an eviction. So it's not the most attractive option, but sending the letter in the first place is very attractive because again, it's one more avenue where you might get paid and not have to worry about this debt anymore. Okay, uh, the suspension applies to the entire lot. Keep that in mind. It's not just the member that is suspended from using this stuff. The suspension doesn't apply to things that are needed for ingress and egress, which means getting in and out of the community. Now the question then arises, well, what if we have a gate and people are allowed to use key fobs? I'd say that issue goes 50-50 as to whether a judge says that that is a method of ingress and egress. That's my opinion, is that it's just one way of getting in and out. Or if the judge says that you're actually somehow blocking them from accessing their property. So you're taking a risk if you do shut off gate transponders. Uh, you can't shut off utility services. Again, question, does that count internet? Does that count cable TV? I don't know. So be careful with uh, shutting those type of, of services off in addition. Um, and then the problem is it doesn't clarify nearly anything beyond the portion of the common areas used to provide access to the parcel or utility services. Um, you can't prohibit, and this is why I use a different color prohibit, vehicular and pedestrian ingress and egress from the parcel, including the, including the right to park if there are parking spaces. So up to you. Uh, the other thing with respect to the pool, the gym, all your other amenities, one risk you take unless you've got someone manning those specific items is chances are their neighbors are going to let them in and let them use it anyway, unless you really point out to the neighborhood, hey, if people were suspended, it's because they did something wrong. Don't let them use it. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't. But that would be something sent via notice to the entire community. Okay, you can also spend voting rights for a delinquency of over 90 days. And the question becomes... Well, what if someone pays $49,999.99 of a $50,000 debt? Well, the, the quick answer is they're still delinquent. So no, there is a portion that's 90 days delinquent. And according to the statute, they're still not current. That suspension remains active. Okay, it's, That's one reason that it's so crucial to keep active records of who owes what to your association. Um, suspended voting interests don't count for any purpose, including a quorum meaning that it may not be the best idea to take away these people's voting rights, because if you're trying to reach a quorum and that's someone that would have otherwise voted, even if it's someone that would have voted against what you want to accomplish at a meeting, they don't get to even count towards a quorum. So believe it or not, you actually do want everyone to try and vote. Um, keep in mind the De Soleil case, which is mentioned here in blue, provides that for those declarations recorded prior to the effective date of the amendment to the statute, the authority to suspend voting rights must be in the association's declaration 
or the declaration must contain that Kaufman language we discussed earlier that incorporates the statutes as amended from time to time to suspend voting rights. Now, keep in mind, this is a condo law case. A lot of the time, those condo cases are transferred over by judges and applied to HOA cases as well. So we mention this because it may be something that is uh, incorporated by a judge. Okay, moving on to the next topic altogether, uh, member meetings. Okay, the annual meeting needs to be held uh, at the location provided in the bylaws. That's pretty easy. I mean, the, the reality is a lot of this stuff is gonna be whatever the bylaws dictate. Uh, special member meetings, which is basically all other member meetings are held when the board calls one. Or, and I have one that, that is potentially coming up soon when a written request of at least 10% of the owners or whatever percentage of the owners that's in the doc, the governing documents is specified, um, when they call by, by written ballot a special meeting or ask for one. Um, keep in mind that 10% sounds like a small figure, but in a community of 1,000, that means you need 100 votes to call a special meeting, okay? And, and if you're in a community of, of 50, that means you still need a couple, okay? So 10% sounds like nothing, but depending on the size of your community, it may still be a lot of people that are needed to call that special meetings. Um, keep in mind with respect back to the annual meeting, you call it however the bylaws say, uh, the election is generally gonna occur at or in conjunction with the annual meeting. One thing that's come up for me recently with a couple clients, the budget meeting is a board meeting unless your governing documents somehow say otherwise. So you can have that in conjunction with the annual meeting, but it's scheduled as a separate board meeting, either just before or just after that election meeting. Now, my thought process is there are two ways to look at whether to do it before or after. If you do it before, the new board comes in and can't be blamed for the budget. But if you do it before, the new board comes in and doesn't have an opportunity to really do much with respect to the budget, except that they're able to speak on it at the at the board meeting. If it comes in after, um, then, you know, unless these potential directors have really followed and paid attention to what the proposed budget says, they're coming in and immediately expected to pass that new budget that they had no part in developing. So personally, I, I prefer that it be before, but that's really up to the board that is allegedly going out, depending on what happens at the election meeting. Okay, members are entitled to at least 14 days notice of every member meeting. That goes via mail, hand delivery, electronic delivery. Uh, and electronic delivery, keep in mind, is only to those members who have uh, agreed to accept notices that way. The affidavit needs to be saved. Uh, and that affidavit is by the person that provides the notice. That notice, that affidavit, uh, of sending the notice goes into the association's official records, gets kept as part of those official records. Okay, unless the governing documents say otherwise, the annual meeting notice doesn't need to say what was this, what is going to be discussed at the meeting other than, well, there will presumably be an election. Special meeting notice does need to specify what's going to be discussed at the meeting. And then other issues such as special assessments may require specific notice as well. The budget technically is an assessment and the, the uh, meeting notice needs to say either the budget or special assessments, maintenance assessments will be discussed at this meeting. If it's maintenance assessments, there's different requirements that we'll get into later. If it's a special assessment, you need to get into, well, here's what the assessments for here are the amounts we're contemplating. Um, member meetings must be held in a handicapped accessible location if anyone who is handicapped requested it. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, quorum, which is basically the number of members that need to be present in order to actually hold a meeting. If you don't have a quorum, you don't have a meeting. Quorum is 30% of the members, unless the documents say otherwise. This is why I said earlier, when you suspend voting rights, that voting right doesn't count towards your quorum anymore. Okay, member decisions require a majority of votes during a meeting at which a quorum is present. That's how you make a decision on behalf of your community, unless the governing documents specify. For example, for amendments, you might have a higher or lower voting percentage required. Okay, so generally speaking, member decisions require that majority of a quorum. Here's another thing that I think that most, if not all communities really should have a written policy on, and that can be contained in your rules and regulations. It doesn't need to be super complex. 
Um, but you do have the right as a member to speak up to three minutes on every agenda topic that is open for discussion during every member meeting and every board meeting. The association can adopt these rules that I mentioned. Um, so that policy is generally going to govern the frequency, duration, or time, which again needs to be at least up to three minutes for member statements. And I hear a lot of communities that have said, well, we don't really need to do that yet. We don't have any problems with members trying to overtake the board or the rest of the members during meetings. Yeah, but once you do, you're not potentially going to be able to hold your meeting and accomplish business in order to pass this thing and curtail that behavior. So keep in mind, this is something that needs to be decided and, and the policy needs to be put in place at an open board meeting. And if it's open, that means that this member that is causing a problem gets to speak on, at that board meeting. So just be careful with it. Um, members can record board meetings and member meetings as well, unless they're closed. Closed meetings with counsel to discuss potential or ongoing litigation can be closed, okay? Meaning the members as a whole are not authorized to participate or attend. It would just be that, that um, board and management. And if there's a committee involved, in other words, if the architectural committee is debating whether to approve something and needs legal guidance, that is potential litigation that could be coming about. So that might be something you can close to the members and hold just with the committee, just with the board, or just with the, ma the manager. Now, keep in mind, the attorney needs to be present during those meetings for that to be closed. You can't just say, we're going to discuss litigation, have no attorney present, and close the meeting anyway. The purpose of that is to allow for attorney-client privilege. If there's no attorney there, there's no privilege. Okay. Um, and then also closed meetings can be to discuss employee matters, the salaries, et cetera, that result from that. And the meeting minutes are still open to the members regardless. Okay. Again, get a meeting participation policy in place. I've, I've seen it save countless clients, countless headaches. Okay. We talk about proxies. This is something we do need to go into very briefly. A general proxy basically says you can vote however you want at this particular meeting on all of the issues or the, the issues that are identified in here. A limited proxy basically says, hey, you can cast a vote on my behalf if you vote this way. You can only vote this way. Okay. You can use these proxies to establish a quorum. They don't need to be signed on the date of the meeting, just to be clear, because I've had that issue come up literally in the last two weeks. Uh, any proxy is effective only for that meeting, including adjournments, meaning if you don't have a quorum and the meeting gets called back two weeks later, two months later, whatever it may be, um, it can only be for 90 days after the date of the first meeting. But as long as it's within that time frame, the proxy is still good unless and until it is revoked by the person that signed it, which can be done at pretty much any time. Um, written consent in lieu of a meeting, that can be used. And this is one of those things that's in chapter 617 that I mentioned a lot of attorneys don't even realize applies to HOAs. It can be used unless it's prohibited directly in the Articles of Incorporation. And the written consent is good for 90 days from the date the first executed con written consent is received. In other words, you got 90 days to collect all these ballots and have your meeting. Elections, okay, this is gonna take a while. Uh, do whatever your bylaws say. Okay, let's move on. Seriously, it's that easy. Um, there may be you know, a, a serious procedure that needs to be followed that is very detailed and specific, but in reality, that's all you gotta do. Check your bylaws or have your attorney do that for you. Um, it, some homeowners associations, property owners associations do follow the condo scheme of um, elections. That's included here. I'm not going to go through it in detail uh, because we have so much to cover. And frankly, that's about five extra minutes. But keep in mind, unless your governing documents say so, you generally don't need to follow that process. You just have an election just as everyone would picture. You have people that show up at a meeting. If there's a quorum, then the members basically put in a ballot that is, um, it is anonymous. They put the ballot in a box. The ballot, bo excuse me, again, talking too much here. The ballots are counted. Whoever gets the most votes wins. That's your election. Um, a couple points that you want to uh, avoid disputes over the validity of the election. Make sure that before you eliminate any nominations at the meeting for HOAs, 
you ensure that the governing documents don't allow these people to be nominated. We'll go through what might limit that in a minute. Uh, and also make sure to formally close the balloting at some point so that you're not just sitting there all night waiting for people to show up or just continuing without having closed it, in which event people can show up at 10 o'clock at night. And if the meeting's still going on, their ballot can be counted. Okay. Uh, you need a quorum, unless the bylaws say otherwise, in order to hold an election. If there's no election, the directors generally will just hold over for one more term, or at least the following year, depending on whether you've got staggered two-year terms or whatever. Um, the process, again, it's going to be regulated by the bylaws. If the election process in the governing documents allows for nominations in advance, the association doesn't have to allow nominations during the election meeting. Notice of the annual meeting must be provided 14 days in advance, uh, unless the bylaws say otherwise, it needs to be mail delivered or electronically transmitted to the members within those uh, 14 or more days, so no less than 14 days. Now, this is, again, the condo election process. Uh, I'm not going to go through it, but bottom line, you need to have a notice 60 days before your election, and this is only if you're following this procedure. Notice of the uh, date of the election 60 days in advance, 40 days in advance, all the candidates need to basically say, here's what I'm going to, uh, I, I'm, I want to be nominated and I want to be a candidate. If the candidate requests it, the association needs to include uh, a, an information sheet that needs to be provided to the association at least 35 days before the election, and then at least 14 days before the meeting, before the election. There's a second notice that goes out, and it encloses the ballots. It also encloses all of those candidate information sheets, uh, and I won't go through the process of counting and all that, but bottom line, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, and, and one thing that you might want to consider if this is the process that your association follows is having an election monitor involved so that you're sure that if there are any challenges to the procedure, um, that person can go back and basically say, no, I, I did everything correctly. Here, here you go. Uh, again, whoever gets the most both votes wins. That's what plurality of the ballots cast means. A vacancy caused by the expiration of the term must be filled by an election. A resignation is generally going to be filled by an appointment or an election. Now, you just went through all of this stuff for an election. Appointment is, hey, the board likes this person as a potential director. We have a board meeting. We vote to appoint that person. They accept. Done. So go with the appointment if it's an option. Um, another thing I've heard, which I mentioned earlier, that's dead wrong. They didn't hold an election for three years. So anything they did during those three years is totally invalid. And I'm suing everyone I've ever met involved with these, these fraudulent elections, basically everyone that has been involved in the community. No, it doesn't work that way. You don't need an election unless there are more candidates than vacancies. In other words, if you've only got two open positions because you've got now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you've got only two spots where people don't want to be on the board, okay? What it means is vacancies are people came off the board, they resigned, they decided not to stay on, or um, you've got terms that ended that now require a vote, whether that person wants to stay or not, okay? If you've only got two of those, two of those open spots, and only one person wants to be on the board that isn't already, you don't need an election for that person to come onto the board, okay? Now, keep in mind, if you are able to make nominations from the floor during the election under your governing documents, you still probably need to hold that election meeting, okay? Um, that's the only exception. You keep the election records and your official records of the association for seven years and any challenge that is raised to the election process, not necessarily just the result, not I don't like the guy or the girl that came onto the board, but I don't like the way that it was handled and it's contrary to our bylaws or Florida law. That is a challenge to the election process. That needs to be raised within 60 days after the election results are announced. Okay, so a candidate is literally anyone who says, I wanna be a candidate except for, we'll talk about who it is in a condo. And I mentioned this because some people follow the condo. 
um, at least 40 days before the annual meeting, you've designated that you want to be on the board and you, you're nominating yourself as a candidate. In an HOA, it's the last opportunity to declare candidacy. That could be during the meeting if, um, if your documents call for members to be uh, nominated from the floor. So keep that in mind. The, the time frame really depends on your governing documents as to when you need to declare that you want to be a candidate. Okay, anyone's eligible to serve except, and here are the exceptions. John Smith's convicted of a felony. He killed 28 people and he wants to be on your board. Super exciting, right? Uh, so John was released from prison five and a half years ago. I don't know how he got out so soon after killing 28 people or at all for that matter, but he made it. Maybe he's in his early 80s and he's still totally with it. Uh, can he serve as a director? Well, if his rights are restored five years ago, the answer is yes. Okay. In other words, he got out of prison five and a half years ago. If they were only restored, however, if he got out four years and 364 days ago, as of the date of the election, sorry, John's SOL. He cannot be on the board. Okay. Now, if someone has that felony on their record or something that would have been a felony if it were committed in Florida, um, if that is on their record and you don't know until after the fact, you can pull them off the board and anything, any votes that they made during their directorship still count. You don't just rescind everything, okay? Um, the other reason that someone can be pulled off or is not on at all is that if you are at least delinquent in the payment of any fee, fine, or other monetary obligation to the association, as of the last date, you can nominate yourself. In other words, the 40 days or depending on what your governing documents say, possibly the date of the election, they cannot seek election. They are not a candidate. If they are on the board and become more than 90 days delinquent, including if that 90-day timeline started before, okay, which it shouldn't because if they were delinquent as of the date of the election, they shouldn't be on the board in the first place. But if they become 90 days delinquent afterwards, so for example, you find one of your directors, they never pay the fine, then they are automatically off without a board decision. They are off the board after that 90 days comes up, okay? This is automatic. It's not a decision. It's not, well, he doesn't like me, so he pulled me off. It's, nope, sorry, you're off. The board needs to consist of three or more members with the number specified in or fixed in accordance with the articles or the bylaws. Your term expires at the end of the term provided in the governing documents. That could be the end of each year, or it could be, like I said, you might have staggered terms or term limits, which, you know, staggered terms is basically, well, these two people get reelected every other year. These two stay on that year and get reelected the next year. Term limits means, well, if the governing documents say you can only serve for eight consecutive years, you can only conserve, you can only serve for eight consecutive years on the board. Okay, your bylaws are generally going to say that. There's no prohibition in an HOA against co-owners serving on the board. Condos, there is here. You're, you're welcome to do it if you feel the need. Hey, verifying outer envelopes. Uh, I'm going to stick skip some of this just to save some time. Uh, again, move to close out the balloting. Once that is approved, it formally cuts off the balloting and any subsequent votes don't count. So you don't have to count them and, and deal with um, stopping allowing the votes. It helps ensure an accurate count. The other thing, if more than one ballot is submitted by any lot, both of those votes are disqualified and they don't count toward the overall votes. But keep them in your official records because they are still records of the association, which you will need in order to prove why that vote didn't count, okay? Um, if your bylaws don't see otherwise, you generally have a president, secretary, and treasurer, and those officers serve without compensation unless the documents say otherwise at the pleasure of the board. What that means is even if you can't kick a director off, that doesn't mean you can't tell one of the directors you're no longer the president by board vote. Okay, so the if if someone is not showing up to meetings or is entirely combative, you can tell that person you no longer are the president. You're not the mouthpiece of the association anymore. Okay, you no longer have an officer position, even though you get to vote during board meetings. Because keep in mind, there's a distinction between directors and officers. The directors are the people that get to vote at board meetings. Officers have specific positions and specific responsibilities unless those responsibilities are taken over by your property manager. Okay, 
Um, again, officers are selected by the board, usually immediately after the election takes place of the directors. Note that it says the officers versus the directors here. Um, directors can't vote by proxy or secret ballot at board meetings, except secret ballots can be used to elect the officers. And there's no prohibitions against changing officers midstream. In other words, I'm the president. I am overwhelmingly busy. I cannot take on this responsibility of being the person that all of our vendors contact, et cetera. We are self-managed. We have no help whatsoever. I need one of the other directors to take over. There's nothing that says that the person that was the secretary can't be the president now, and the president can't switch to be the secretary and just maintain the records and the meeting minutes. Okay. Now, keep in mind, that doesn't mean that this person suddenly has no obligations. They're just different obligations. Okay. But, but that can be done. It just gets done at a board meeting where the board votes and says, we're going to vote to switch these people. That can be done by secret ballot. It doesn't have to be. You can use an online voting system. Electronic voting is becoming really prevalent over the last few years. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but we do actually have a really good presentation that I believe our partners, I think it was uh, Mike Bender and Jeff Rembaum did that you can find on our website if you want more information about electronic voting. What you're really going to want to do is rely on your electronic voting vendor. So you need to use a specific company that does this, frankly, for a living. And you're going to want to rely on your association attorney and manager, if you have one, uh, to make sure that this is done right, because there are very specific statutory requirements that these vendors need to follow. Most of them do, but just make sure that you're getting a recommendation from someone as to who you should be using. There are a few that we work with really well, uh, but again, you know that, that webinar is, is gonna be really good to look at if you wanna know more about electronic voting. The board, every director, every single person other than managers who have a different duty, but every director and every officer of every community association in Florida owes a fiduciary responsibility to the the member excuse me um, to the members of the community and needs to act reasonably okay in other words it's okay to not be right on occasion this business judgment rule basically says you owe this fiduciary responsibility but we're going to judge you by you'll excuse me but the dumbest person in the room standard so the standard is if you reasonably believed that what you were doing as a director or an officer was in the best interest of the association. And it wasn't done with malice. It wasn't done, you know, grossly negligently. It wasn't done um, for, for the purpose of hurting someone else or for some other bad reason. Um, if it's in the good faith belief that what you're doing is in the association's best interest, you're generally protected from personal liability. That doesn't mean the association doesn't get sued and lose. It means that you, generally speaking, will not be personally held liable. Most declarations have an indemnity clause for the directors and officers, but the most important bill, well, second most important bill that you can pay as a community association officer and director on behalf of that community is your directors and officers liability insurance premium, okay? Now, I said that's the second. Obviously, your attorney is the most important. Um, but bottom line, if we didn't have this super low, again, excuse me, but dumbest person in the room standard, no one would want to be willing to volunteer as a director. Okay, So that's why we do it this way. We make sure that everyone is required to do what they unilaterally think is in the best interest of the association, but we're not going to help hold them to a super high standard like you would with an attorney or a property manager who's presumed to know better. Okay, you can't be compensated. You can't receive a salary or compensation except if the governing documents say otherwise. Um, this is really conflict is what we're talking about where you have a financial interest in a corporation or a business that the association is considering using as a vendor. Um, you can't participate you can't be. You can be reimbursed for out-of-pockets uh, expenses, subject to certain approval procedures. Um, there, there are very few things that you can do as a director and be compensated for it, uh, unless the governing documents specifically say, or a majority of the total voting interests, voting in person or by proxy at a meeting of the members, says that you can be compensated for it. Uh, a developer or its representative that serves as an officer, director, blah 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 generally might be able to be compensated. 
Okay, the corporate powers of a corporation not for profit are exercised by the board. This is why an individual member of the community can't talk to your vendors and tell them you need to change what you're doing because the contract is not with the individual members. The contract is with the corporation, which is governed by its board. So the board's responsible for carrying out the association's duties. No director, no board member or officer, even the president, should be making unilateral decisions unless power is delegated. And when I say delegated, I mean via a board motion and approved vote. Or it's a true emergency, not a, well, I wanted to get this done quickly, so it was an emergency, but a, we're in the middle of a hurricane and we need to get this stuff cleaned up, or something is going to fly through somebody's window and it's dangerous. Okay. Um, the board is responsible for the maintenance of the association property, the health, safety, and welfare of the entire community. Okay. So this, these are responsibilities that you as directors all face here. Now, when does a board meeting happen? To be clear, there's no such thing as sunshine law applying to condos, HOAs, or co-ops in Florida. There is a similar law, but that sunshine law, if someone says, well, you're subject to sunshine laws. No, we're not. Municipal entities, government is subject to sunshine law. We are required to comply with chapter 720, which means anytime a quorum of directors, usually a majority, is conducting association business and meeting for that purpose. Okay, so if you have a five-member board and three out of those are out for happy hour dinner and start discussing that the association should throw a party and the association is going to fund this, it's going to be done at the clubhouse, that's association business. You should have notified the members that you were going to hold that meeting. Now, just like members are entitled to an, uh, attend and speak at member meetings, Members are entitled to attend and speak at board meetings, which means not only should you have given notice of that meeting that you're holding during happy hour, either at somebody's house, at a restaurant or a bar, but you should have given them the right to attend, in other words, join you at the table and speak during your happy hour, okay? That's going to ruin your drinks, but it's something you're obligated to do, okay? So that that is a board meeting, Um same thing applies to committees that the meeting includes a member vote on whether to spend association funds or any architectural review bodies meetings. Okay, so uh, we are halfway through or actually more than halfway through. We have 100 slides to get through. So I'm going to speed along and skip some of this material. Again, it's all available to you whenever you need it. Um, and, and you will have access to these slides when you get the link at the end of the presentation today. So don't freak out that we're kind of skipping some of this but we are gonna to have to speed it up a little. Okay, so ratification, written agreement. These are things that you can do, uh, unauthorized actions that can still bind the association. In other words, this person had no right to do this, they did it anyway, okay? The board may take action outside a properly noticed board meeting. You can ratify certain things at the next properly noticed meeting. In other words, you still had a meeting, you just had it after the fact, you still held the full discussion, you still had a member, a uh, board member vote, a director vote, and you still went about things the right way, it was just after the fact, okay? Then we've got the issue of apparent authority, in other words, well, you know, it seems like someone should have authority to do that, but there was never a meeting to authorize that person, that president usually, to sign this agreement, okay? You need to inform your vendors who is an authorized contact to submit change orders, to discuss and sign agreements, and who is not authorized to do that. Board members may use email as a means of communication. In other words, you can chat and, and discuss issues, but you cannot cast a vote. You can't make a decision via email. You can do it by written instrument. That's under Chapter 617. It's another one of those things. Oh, yeah, okay. That's that. Statute still applies. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, no free lunch. If the board finds that an officer or director has violated the subsection of the Florida statutes by which they cannot solicit, offer to accept, or accept any goods or services, in other words, bribes, or e even if they're small, um, then that officer or director is immediately removed by the board. Uh, the vacancy is filled according to law until the end of that director's term. Now, keep in mind, that is not a suspension. It's a removal. You're off. You're done. If uh, Keep in mind, if, you, if we were doing this webinar in person and we had food, okay, you could accept that. Or if you're at a trade show, for example, in April, I'll be at the Condo and HOA uh, Expo in Orlando. Okay, You come to something like that and you want to uh, grab a stress ball 
or in a, a folder with our logo and, and some information, that is allowed up to $25 in value, okay? So keep that in mind. Anything that's greater than that, can't do it. Uh, a director or officer charged by information or indictment, meaning that they were arrested and the police actually, or the, the state's attorney actually pursued the claims uh, with a felony theft or embezzlement offense involving association funds is removed. Don't have to wait until they're found guilty. That vacancy is filled by the board until the end of the suspension period. In other words, when the person is actually found not guilty, if they are found not guilty, or the end of the term, whichever occurs first. And if the charges are pending, you cannot be appointed or elected to a director position. I think that makes sense. Okay, we've got some timelines here. Board meetings, you need to give 48 hours notice posted on the property in a specific location designated by the board. Now you can also give seven days mailed notice. The posting is the easiest, cheapest, and quickest way. Uh, board meetings, 14 day notice required for um, any non-emergency special assessments, amending to rules regulating unit or parcel use. I would argue that it might also be required because the statute talks about assessments. Uh, it might be required for your budget meeting as well. And agendas, you don't have to have an agenda. I recommend that you do it anyway. And the reason for that, and I say recommend rather than just suggest, because that way you can have your policy dictate that the members who are attending your board meetings can only speak on the items that are on the agenda. If you don't have an agenda, they can say whatever they want for those three minutes. And every time you bring up another topic, technically they might get another three minutes. And every time someone else that isn't a director brings up another topic, they might get another three minutes, okay? Um, and again, notices where I think we discussed this, if 20% of the voting interest petition the board to address an item, the board within 60 days needs to place that item on the agenda at the next board meeting or at a special meeting called for that purpose. Now, this is similar to what the members are allowed to call, but it requires a higher member interest, okay? So remember, 10% if the members want a member meeting, special member meeting, 20% if the members want a board meeting, a special board meeting. Again, we talked about members are entitled to participate, they're entitled to attend, they're entitled to videotape, just like a member meeting, pretty much the same thing here. Uh, again, you should have your policy regarding meetings govern both member meetings and board meetings. Quorum of the board present at a board meeting is a quorum. It's a majority of the board. So if you've got a five member board, three members of that board is a quorum that would allow you to hold that meeting. Sorry, stepped ahead. Well, I guess we'll move forward. Um, okay, uh, a board workshop doesn't exist. A committee workshop doesn't exist. It's used as a tool to get around noticing board or committee meetings because no decisions are being made. You still should have a board meeting and have it open to the members. Okay, the, the, the workshop is not a thing that is authorized by Florida law. Committee meetings, again, we talked about um, these, just like board meetings, these meetings need to be open to the members. Uh, if a meeting of a committee or similar body is making a final decision regarding expending association funds, and then any architectural committee that can approve or disapprove architectural decisions, that meeting where they're intending to do so also needs to be open to the members. Contracts between association and directors, uh, you can have them. Conflicts are not always the worst thing in the world. This is, again, conflicts, but um, you, know, you may actually get a better deal as a result of that uh, member's family being interested in the business. Uh, the director can present the contract, and you need a two-thirds vote of the other directors rather than just a majority of the quorum in order to pass and have that contract approved. And when I say the other directors, I mean not counting the director who has a direct interest in this or an indirect interest in it. And that makes sense. You don't want them um, intimidating or influencing the other directors into just signing on with this vendor, okay? Um, so the contract needs to be reasonable and fair to the association. In other words, you're not just pushing the board into this. And then at the next regular or special member meeting, which might be the election, it might be another meeting, uh, the existence of the contract with the director must be disclosed to the membership. If the members move during that meeting to cancel the contract, a majority vote of the members present 
is sufficient to cancel that contract. Okay. If that happens, the association is only liable for the reasonable value of goods and services provided up to the time of cancellation and not a termination fee, liquidated damages, or other penalties. That's statutory. So that's one protection that the legislature has actually put in here. And the disclosure required is what they call the third degree of consanguinity in English. That means spouses, children, parents, siblings, grandchildren, uncles, aunts, and grandparents. Okay, so that's that's the levels up and down that we're talking about and across. The ways to get off the board, resign in writing, a recall, which we'll talk about later, delinquent and the payment of a monetary obligation for more than 90 days we discussed, uh, charges involving theft we discussed, failure to satisfy the certification requirement, which is a suspension, not a removal. That's why you're in this class today, hopefully. Uh, receipt of an excessive gift beyond that $25 and not mentioned here. If you die, you can't continue serving on the board. I know that sounds crazy, but it's the way it works. Uh, budgets. The board needs to prepare an annual budget. It's basically the board's best guess of what you're going to need for the coming year to properly maintain and operate the community. You need to account for all reasonably anticipated expenses and income over the following year. If your association actually follows the budget nearly exactly for what was in each line item, you're either somehow the luckiest community in all of the world, or you're probably doing it wrong, meaning you're basically limiting your expenses to match your original estimate, which is almost always going to be wrong, um, especially with inflation being what it has been the last few years. You need to comply with your fiduciary duty to ensure that the expenses or whatever is needed to properly maintain and operate the community. Okay, that duty includes the operation uh, obligation to properly budget. If, if you need another billion dollars this year as compared to last year, then that's what you need to increase your assessments subject to limitations in the, declar in the, in the bylaws. Um, and then at that point, it's on the owners to vote for a different budget and replace it with a different one. OK, but it's the directors have no right to artificially reduce or water down the budget in order to placate the membership and look better and say, look, we kept the assessments down. I've got a community right now that's about to increase its assessments by a couple hundred dollars a month. And that's because a prior set of directors basically decided, well, we're just going to raid the reserves and, and we're not going to actually go ahead and you know have the assessments be what they really need to be for us to comply with our fiduciary responsibility. Uh, normally, I would have more to say, but I think I've I've been pretty clear. You need to put in whatever really needs to be in your budget and not water it down. Okay, um, there are a bunch of things that need to be in your budget. It's basically estimated common expenses, estimated income. Um, there are different categories and line items of what goes in. If you have reserves, that goes into your budget as well. We'll we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then what each member is going to be paying by way of assessments each period, whether that's monthly, quarterly, annually, whatever. Once the board prepares the budget, it's usually adopted by the board. That's why I said it's a separate meeting from the annual election. It's not part of the same meeting. One is a member meeting. This is a board meeting. OK, if the documents don't say otherwise, uh, the budget, the, the notice of the board meeting when the budget will be considered and adopted needs to be only conspicuously posted on the community property 48 hours in advance of the meeting. Okay, there is a chance that 14 days notice is required. I've never seen a judge say so, but that's the assessment provision that says, you know, it, 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 the uh, notice needs to at least say assessments will be considered and what the nature of the assessments are. In my opinion, Posting this 48 hours in advance in a notice that says assessments will be considered and uh, says the nature of the assessments and offers a copy of the budget when when any, anyone asks for, which, by the way, you could take care of that by posting a copy of the budget along with the notice on your bulletin board or whatever. Uh, once the budget's been adopted, the association must provide each member with a copy or notice that a, a uh, copy is available upon request at no charge to the member. So this is your records inspection, basically. Uh, someone can ask for the budget in particular, you cannot charge for that one. Okay, now let me clarify that last statement. If you've already provided them the budget after it was adopted and they ask again, that is not part of this notice requirement and you technically could charge if the records inspection statute says you can charge in general. 
So sorry, I just needed to clarify that point because I'm sure there's one or two people on here that will say, no, that's wrong. Um, okay, uh, an HOA budget is not required to provide for reserves. Like I said, uh, unless the reserves are created by the membership or the developer or um, the, de the declaration or the bylaws say that they're required. Okay, that's the only reason you'd need it. So we're not going to take a lot of time on reserves because, frankly, most communities don't have them. Um, the thing to keep in mind is reserves are generally not going to be what you're spending every year to maintain things. These are large assets, large expenses for maintenance and repairs that happens, let's say, once every five to 10 years or are more than, let's say, $10,000 that it's going to cost you in any particular year. OK, if, if what we're talking about is your monthly pool maintenance, where you have someone come in, that's not something you need to reserve for. That's just part of your annual budget. A reserve is we're saving up money year after year to make sure that when we need it, we'll have it available without needing to add that hundred thousand dollars to replace the clubhouse roof as either a special assessment or the assessment portion in one year instead of in 10 to 20 years, however long that roof might last. Okay, uh, we talked about reserves maybe established by the membership. We'll skip that. Computing them, essentially what you're calculating here, and I would normally go into a little more detail, but we're running short on time already. Um, what you need to calculate is how long is this thing expected to last, whatever this asset is? What is it going to cost according to the person that I am purchasing or uh, having service it, what is it going to cost to do the repairs or replacement that's going to be needed once that timeline expires? And I'm going to divide that by the amount of years, I, I'm going to divide that total dollar figure by the amount of years I have left. That's how much I reserve every year. Now you might do a reserve study. Frankly, you should do a reserve study every few years. Or, uh, and, and what a reserve study is, is you're basically having an expert come in and tell you whether that price what it's going to cost to maintain or repair or replace, whether that price has gone up or down in the time since you initially got the estimate. So you can adjust your reserves each year based on what that figure changes to. You can increase it if it's going to cost more. You can decrease it if it's going to cost less than you originally anticipated. The alternative is to just adjust for inflation, which obviously is an option, but is a lot less, um, a lot less specific and a lot less accurate. You can waive or reduce reserves if they're established. Again, you don't have to have them at all unless your governing documents or your members have said so by a majority of a quorum of the owners. That's who needs to vote at a member meeting in order to waive or reduce reserves for that fiscal year. Again, it's only that budget year. Um, the board doesn't have to submit that request to the members, even if the members want to say we want to waive reserves. It's really at the discretion of the board whether to ask. You can also terminate reserves by the exact same vote, uh, but it's a majority of the total voting interests as compared to a majority of a quorum. Those are two very actually different votes that you need to be aware you know, whether your specific type of vote says majority of a quorum or majority of the total voting interests. Majority of a quorum, if your quorum is 30%, means that you may only need 16% of your members voting in favor of whatever you're trying to accomplish. A majority of the total voting interest means you need 50% plus one. So just be cognizant of these two different things that are stated throughout these materials and throughout the Florida statutes and your governing documents. Okay. Uh, reserve funds can only be used, including interest, uh, for the specific purpose that was stated unless a majority vote of the owners, again, this is a majority of a quorum, uh, at a duly, member, uh, duly called membership meeting say, well, we're going to do this differently. We're going to use these funds for something else that we think is more important. We have the clubhouse burned down. We don't have one anymore. We don't need those funds in a reserve for the clubhouse unless our intent is to rebuild one and the insurance money didn't cover it, presuming it was insured, which it should be. Um, you can have pooled versus straight line accounts for uh, reserves. We're not going to go through those in much depth, but bottom line, pool uh, uh, straight line accounts is basically you have each reserve item where you're accounting for it separately. Pooled reserves are you shove all the money together for everything you're reserving for or several reserve items 
And you're basically going to have the money available as each thing comes up rather than having excess money that you won't need for, let's say, 10 years. So let's see. Financial reports. Uh, within 90 days after the end of the fiscal year, the association needs to prepare and complete or contract with a third party, meaning an accountant or someone of that nature, to prepare and complete a financial report for the preceding fiscal year. Within 21 days after that report is completed or received from that vendor, but not later than 120 days after the end of the fiscal year. In order, in, in other words, you're limited in how long your vendor can even work on this. The association needs to provide each owner with a copy of the financial report or a written notice that it's available, just like you could with the budget. Okay. We get into different levels of reporting required for uh, different levels of monetary revenue and annual revenue. Um, I won't get into the details, but the bottom line, you're talking about more money, more problems. That's it. Okay. And just things that you should know. Um, if you don't know about these things and you are a, a client, feel welcome to reach out. I don't have time to go through them right now. Uh, all board meetings and frankly, all member meetings should have minutes taken. It's basically not verbatim records of everything that was discussed, but just who voted and how. Uh, it doesn't need to be extremely detailed. It can be, what was the motion? How did the members or how did, did the board vote on that motion? That's pretty much it. Uh, it should also include, we opened the meeting at this time, we closed the meeting at this time. The votes were made by X people. If it's, if it's unanimous, you can just say that instead of recording each individual vote, but each director's vote should be in there. And an abstention should also be in there if the director abstained. Now, I've also had the issue come up where someone didn't like the topic that was being discussed as a director and they abstained because they didn't want to vote. That's not your prerogative as a director. You abstain only because you have a conflict of interest regarding that particular issue. If you have no conflict and the conflict is not, I don't like this. A conflict is I have a financial interest in this because the corporation we're considering using as a vendor, like I said earlier, is related, you know, is, is owned and operated by someone I'm related to in the third degree of consanguinity, which is what I, we discussed earlier. That is why you can abstain. It's not I don't like it. It's I can't vote under Florida law. The governing documents may grant the association a right of access. If they don't, you technically don't automatically have the right to access. And that makes sense in an HOA as compared to a condo, because in an HOA, unless you really need to get into someone's property, you're probably going to be able to go through, you know, if, if you need to access that property, you probably won't need to get into the property itself unless there is a need for a police presence or a firefighter presence. Uh, in other words, there's a true emergency, whereas in a condo, you know, unless you're in an HOA that so somehow has shared walls and things of that nature, you're not going to have leaks from one unit or from common areas into another unit, so to speak. OK, so you may have that right, but you need to check your governing documents or more likely have your attorney do so. The Marketable Record Title Act. This basically says that if your covenants were recorded 30 or more years ago, they are no longer good unless you've recorded something that says that you want to preserve those covenants. Covenants. So this, this MARTA law, Marketable Record Title Act, basically says that your covenants cease to exist and are no longer enforceable 30 years after the initial recordation of your declaration. In other words, those covenants are no longer enforceable, but the association's obligations don't go away. What that means for practical purposes is that you might have to go ahead and figure out how to pay uh, all of your expenses and maintain and operate the community without having any dollars that you can go after because you no longer have an assessment covenant. Okay, so this is something that is very, very bad. You do not want this to expire. Okay, what you want is to preserve the covenants before they expire. And this is something that for all our clients, we track this very closely and we give notice, you know, years before, a year before, six months before. Uh, we make sure that we give every opportunity to avoid having this happen. Uh, if not, you need a majority of all of the affected owners to vote in favor of a revitalization of those covenants in order for them to kick back in. Now, that's a process as compared to, you know, a couple hundred, couple thousand dollars uh, at most for a MARTA uh, preservation you're talking about a revitalization costing. I've seen upwards of ten to $15,000 for all the work that goes into that on your lawyer's end and on your end. 
Okay, so make sure that you avoid that expiration. Um, all HOAs can use the preservation. It's literally, we record a document that includes all of the recorded covenants that you wanna preserve. The board has a meeting and reviews it and approves it, signs it, and we record it, that's it. That's how easy this is to avoid having to go through a $15,000 process. So bottom line, avoid having to go through that process. I was just discussing this with a, a colleague literally last night in ends of court meeting. And it is, it is ugly when this happens uh, because you'll excuse me, but communities can go to crap real quick when people realize they can do whatever the heck they want in your community. Um, now at the first board meeting, excluding the organizational meeting after the annual election, the board has to consider the desirability of filing notices, basically filing this preservation instrument. So if you don't consider this every year and act within a reasonable time before that expires, there's really no excuse to be candid. Uh, process servers who are delivering lawsuits to people need to be allowed into your community, even if you have a gate and even in common areas and common elements where they're attempting to serve process on a defendant or witness who lives in the community or is known to be in the community. If you have literally no basis to believe they're in the community, you might have an excuse to say, sorry, you can't come in. Anyone else, you need to let them in. Rules and regs, we discussed. Uh, the board can basically adopt these rules and regulations at a board meeting after giving 14 days notice to the members that the board is contemplating doing this. Uh, the notice must be mailed and posted in a conspicuous place in the community. Otherwise, it's 48 hours. Okay, a copy of the rule and regulation adopted should be provided to every owner in advance of the effective date of the rule or regulation. In other words, it should be adopted. You send it out to everyone and you record it in the public records if you want. Uh, that, that gives everyone notice versus just giving your current members notice uh, to ensure that the owners know about the new rule and frankly can comply with it. Okay, we talk about material alterations. This is changes to the appearance of buildings or common areas. Um, Various cases and arbitration decisions rendered by the division, and the, the arbitration is generally going to be pertaining to condos, but um, certain things are material alterations. The subdivision of a room previously used for social gatherings into two separate rooms to construct a board meeting room, conversion of a game room into an office for the manager or conversion of the manager's office to a locked storage room. I'm not going to go through all of these but these are what material alterations may be. The statute doesn't require a membership approval for these, but the governing documents may require membership approval uh, on all these alterations, or it may limit the dollars you can spend to do this before you need member approval. So again, get with your attorney, review the governing documents, find out whether you need member approval before you just go ahead and do whatever you wanna do. Uh, there is an exception to the approval requirement. The Tiffany Plaza case is essentially a case where material alterations to protect the association assets generally don't require member vote, even if you normally would need it. Uh, the objecting owners still have to pay the assessment that's levied to cover the cost of that alteration. Here, essentially, you had, um, I'm going to skip the uh, arbitration, but Tiffany Plaza was a case where there's a rock wall that was built basically a, a I would call it a seawall right at the uh, edge of a waterway. And this rock wall was being built up in a different way than it previously looked, but for the purpose of additional protection for the association. In other words, the, the water was not going to spill over onto the sidewalks, onto common areas, et cetera. That was done for the purpose of protection, not for you know, visible appearance. And so it was allowed by, by the court, even though a member vote was not obtained. Architectural standards need to be very specific. They need to be in writing. The old school, um, aesthetically pleasing and in the same vein as the rest of the community is probably not going to cut it anymore under the amendments to the Florida statutes that were passed a couple of years ago. Uh, the they authority to govern and frankly, the um, I, I strongly recommend having specific guidelines in place for, for, you know, materials that can be used for specific things, sizes, et cetera, uh, appearances, uh, 
Um, if that's not in some type of rule and regulation or architectural criteria, you might not be able to enforce, even though your declaration says you've got the general right to do so. So I would suggest that if you don't have those specific guidelines in place, get them together now. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. It can be exactly what your community was already requiring. Just put it in writing so that no one can come back and say, I didn't know what I was allowed to do and what not to do. Uh, something not mentioned here, but is a federal law. It's called OTARD. Um, it's a law that basically says you have to allow satellite dishes in your community, but you can govern the location in your governing documents. They don't have to submit an application to install a satellite dish before installing it, but they do have to follow the board's direction as to where it can be located. So if they install it, you can tell them they need to move it to a location that's been approved as long as it doesn't impair the actual use of that satellite dish or similar device. And same with, um, there's a statute regarding energy efficient devices. You can limit the location of solar panels, clotheslines, and a few other items, but you can't say you're not allowed to have them. Again, another one, Florida friendly landscaping statutes that I'm not gonna bother going through, but you're welcome to take a look at them or consult with your attorney if you're worried about them. Now we talked about emergencies earlier. There is a statute that governs the association's rights and the board's rights during a declared state of emergency. We, we saw this happening during hurricanes before um, and more recently, or not more recently, because we had several recently, uh, several recent hurricanes that there were declared states of emergency locally, uh, but in 2021, these powers were clarified to include a pandemic, and it's basically anything that is being done in response to damage or injury caused by, or, and this is what was changed, in anticipated in connection with an emergency defined in the Florida statutes for which a state of emergency is declared. Okay, so the scope of this law, the board can do a lot of things that are in the statutes without a, a member meeting or a board meeting, um, you still want to try and accommodate and still have meetings. But with the ability to use Zoom and things of that nature now, there's really less of an excuse. But that all came about largely because of these changes in circumstances and st circumstances and statutes. The other thing to keep in mind, and I won't go through the rest of this, this um, several slides, but the duration of this right to use the emergency powers is only as long as the state of emergency is declared. So when the governor or whoever else that declared the state of emergency says that it's over, at least for purposes of the state, the local municipality, whatever it may be, that's when your right to use this emergency statute ends as well. Okay, we've got the emergency powers. Again, you can, you can go through this. Uh, if you have an emergency, you should be contacting your attorney anyway, so hopefully you would contact your attorney before you try and use those statutes. Uh, the emergency kit that every director should have available, pen and paper in case your electronics die, uh, disposable cameras, walkie-talkies, same reasons, important vendor contact information, preferably on a printed sheet somewhere, and uh, the other one that I'll add that most people don't seem to think of is an external battery pack and a generator um, so that a, a lot of the devices that you might have that can serve some of these functions will just last longer even after the power goes out. We talk about leasing amendments. Uh, there's a new statutory amendment that was effective July of 2021. Any amendment to governing documents en enacted after that date that prohibits or regulates rental agreements will only apply to an owner who acquires title after the effective date or agreed to the amendment. In other words, voted in favor of it. Now, regardless of that, there is now an exemption or an exception, whatever you want to call it, an association amendment that prohibits or regulates rental agreements for a term less than six months. In other words, short-term rentals, Airbnb and the like, um, can prohibit that rental for more than three times in a calendar year. And that amendment applies to everyone across the board, regardless of whether they voted for it or not. Okay, These rental restrictions don't apply to associations with 15 or less owners. Okay, so keep just keep this stuff in mind. Uh, a change of ownership does occur in certain circumstances that it didn't before. These are things you're going to want to talk with your attorney about. Uh, if you don't think you can get the vote, by the way, for any amendment, including these leasing amendments, uh, which I've seen fairly frequently in communities where there is a large uh, 
unit or landowner that has, let's say, 10 to 15 units or more, um, start by amending the quorum and amendment provisions and then try and accomplish the original goal in amending once it's easier to make that amendment happen with you know less, less people showing up. Because a lot of times, frankly, those people that own multiple units just don't show, and that's why you can't get the amendment passed in the first place. Okay, this talks about when a licensed manager is required. Frankly, from my perspective, it's recommended for every community association, but these are certain uh, times when a manager needs to be licensed versus just hiring someone to take care of certain tasks for the association. Okay, we're not gonna go through exactly what they are, but you can read them here. Uh, a proposal to amend the governing documents must contain the full text of the amendment, amended provision. And there are certain ways that your attorney will need to draft the amendment that we won't go through just for time purposes. Uh, but the term governing documents does not include rules and regulations. So those are typically adopted by the board and we distinguish those because generally you're gonna have your members voting for amendments to the declaration, the bylaws and the articles of incorporation, whereas your rules and regs, your, your board gets to decide what goes into those, your directors. Okay, uh, disputes between HOAs and owners, mediate, mediate, mediate. It's great that that option is there and that it's frankly required before most disputes go to litigation. Um, it, it really will help the association alleviate some of the fees and costs that could have been incurred in litigation that you can end up settling before you even file your lawsuit. The other thing that I'll bring up that isn't in the slides, there was a decision in April 2022 uh, that basically supports and and I won't say supersedes, but comes after another 10-year-old decision where if you have what's called a self-help right in your governing documents, in other words, you're allowed to go on to someone's property and cure a covenant violation. In other words, cut their grass, clean their, their windows or their driveway. Uh, you might have to threaten to do that rather than seek an injunction. Okay. Now, an injunction is just one right that you can get. It basically is a court order that says someone has to do something or is not allowed to do something. And if they violate it, in addition to violating your existing covenants, they're violating a court order and you go back to court and get them held in contempt potentially. Okay. But this is a case that basically says you can't just go straight for your injunction if you haven't tried for uh, your, your curative action. Um, and a lot of declarations do provide that right. So it's something that you should discuss with your attorney if if it's nothing that you've ever gone to try and, and use as a tool in your arsenal before, because it's a very useful one. Um, disputes that are subject to pre-suit mediation requirements. It's frankly, most things, the ones that are not are really more important. But when you talk about covenant enforcement, amendments, meetings of the board and meetings of the members, uh, accept the election, access to financial, uh, I'm sorry, official records of the association and covenant enforcement. That's what we're talking about here. Pretty much anything else is not going to go to pre-suit mediation. It's either going to go to court or to the division if it's an HOA election or recall dispute. Okay. Um, the pre-suit mediation procedure, basically you send a letter that's good for 20 days that says, here's the dispute that we have and, and what we think you're doing wrong. And this can be sent by the association or the owners. Uh, and it basically says, here's what we think you're doing wrong. You have 20 days to respond, agreeing to choose one of the five mediators we've listed in this letter. And if you don't, then you've waived your right to recover your attorney's fees and costs in any lawsuit that we just decide to file regarding this particular dispute. And it's going to outline exactly what that dispute is, what your authority is. In other words, the provisions of the declaration and the Florida statutes that apply. And if they respond and agree to mediate, you go to mediation. If they don't agree to mediate, then you go straight to your lawsuit. And hopefully mediation results in a settlement. That's the entire purpose of that procedure, which is essentially mediation is getting the two parties in a room with someone who is impartial by nature, is required to be impartial, and gets the parties together to try and figure out, okay, what can we do to get these people to settle and not have to go forward with a lawsuit? An impasse is basically when the parties don't settle at mediation or the other party doesn't respond or responds and then refuses to schedule the mediation within 90 days after the letter was sent. If that happens, you treat it as though they didn't respond at all, you move forward with their lawsuit. Now, there's different legal ramifications if they responded and didn't mediate or if you went to mediation and didn't settle. But the bottom line is once that happens, once you reach the impasse, you can file your lawsuit. Now you can go to non-binding arbitration. It's not really something that we recommend. 
Um, the primary reason is mediation is frankly quicker. Uh, arbitration can take a while and then you need to still file your lawsuit if the owner doesn't comply with the arbitrator's order. Uh, or frankly, if you lose the arbitration, you have to file a lawsuit to appeal it. And so my suggestion is go to mediation, see if you can get this settled instead of immediately going into fight or flight mode. And if you're not able to get it settled, then you just go straight to your lawsuit and let a judge make a decision. Okay. Um, the party filing the arbitration does need to inform the other party of their intent. Same thing as the offer for pre-suit mediation. You're basically saying, hey, there's a violation here. Here's what the violation is. If you don't cure it, we're going to go through with, with pre uh, non-binding arbitration. And it can be binding if the parties agree to be bound to the arbitrator's decision in writing, in which event you still might end up having to file a lawsuit just to enforce that final order, not to, um, you know, to, to get any kind of decision regarding its validity. Okay, these are frankly reasons why the division does certain things uh, in arbitration. I won't go through that in detail. Uh, in the enforcement process, really the first step is to basically say, hey, you did something wrong, fix it. And here's a specific time frame. And if you don't fix it within that time frame, here's what we're going to do next. And usually that's going to be your offer for pre-suit mediation. The offer says if you don't cure the violations and we don't settle at mediation, we'll file a lawsuit. Uh, another thing is the $100,000 rule. Um, if a suit brought by the association and in involves more than $100,000 in damages, that's usually going to be a against a contractor, a uh, vendor. Um, you need a vote of a majority of the members voting on the issue. Okay, so in other words, majority of members at a meeting, at a quorum. Um, if you don't get the authorization in advance, you can go get the vote after. This is not a sword that a defendant in a lawsuit can use to say, you had no right to file this lawsuit and it needs to be dismissed. You just basically place the case on hold. You go get your membership authorization and you come back to court and say, judge, we can move forward now. Um, attorney's fees in general are only going to be awarded if they're authorized by contract or statute. You're almost never going to be made fully whole. We get a little more aggressive in that area than some other law firms. But keep in mind, if you don't have a contract, meaning your declaration doesn't say, if we send you a demand notice, we get to recover our attorney's fees, even if we didn't file a lawsuit. That's rare. So most of the time, this covenant enforcement process is going to say, you know what, that enforcement process, when you send those notices by through your attorney, that's a cost of doing business unless you settle or you file your lawsuit and win. So just keep this in mind. It's something that the board is obligated to do, and you want to be uniform, you want to be consistent, and you want to do this in a timely manner so that you build the board's credibility and you avoid all the defenses to enforcement, but don't expect to get paid in full every penny in attorney's fees and costs that the association spends. We make every effort to get you guys paid in full, but the likelihood, and, and again, this only applies to our clients, of course, uh, but but the likelihood that that's going to happen with any attorney and a judge is going to say, yeah, I'm going to award every penny. It, it's generally low, even though the fees are reasonable. Okay, official records. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip through this. There is an entire list of what's included in your official records. The easy way of looking at this is look at this catch all in section 13 here. All written records of the association, which are related to the operation of the association. In other words, anything that's reasonably related to the association's business and the operation or maintenance of the association needs to be maintained in these official records. You need to keep them for seven years, except the board certifications are five or until the director comes off the board, whichever's longer. Um, bids for work to be done need to be kept only for one year. And then there are certain records that are permanently maintained from the inception of the association, not just for those one, five, or seven years. So just look at this list. I'm not going to read through it just because we're running out of time already. Um, again, running out of time. Uh, there are certain records that are not at all accessible to the members, and that's because of privacy rights and privileges that apply to pretty much everyone. It's basically attorney-client privilege or work product privilege, uh, regarding litigation or an adversarial administrative proceeding, that privilege ends when that proceeding is over, by the way. The question is, when is it over? Is it when the appeal process ends? Is it when someone can no longer come back and seek to vacate a judgment? I don't know is the answer. 
Um, and then there are other records that are not accessible. Uh, people can consent to disclosure of personal information. And if the association inadvertently discloses some of this information, you're not liable for that inadvertent disclosure. Okay, attorney-client privilege, like we said, any record that is protected by privilege is not subject to disclosure or inspection. Um, we Only the board gets to waive that privilege, not the lawyer. And if someone does send a records request, in other words, I want to inspect the association's official records, it doesn't need to specify what records they want to look at. It doesn't need to be specific at all. Um, this is another thing that the board can adopt reasonable rules about, which I recommend you do. If the records are maintained online, you may need a computer so that owners that don't have a computer or a phone or a tablet can access them. Um, you need to provide them within, again, 10 business days. And in this case, if you don't do that, it's not just you don't get fees. It's that you don't have, or I'm sorry, that the owner actually has a claim against the association for $10 per business day after that 10 business days is up. In other words, starting on business day 11 and all of their attorney's fees and costs incurred in enforcing the request. Okay, there are certain limitations on the rules that you can adopt. I can't go through them because we're already short on time. Um, again, we talked about what happens. It's $50 a day up to 10 business days starting on the 11th business day. I call that the $500 gift by the end of it. You don't want to give up that $500 gift. Uh, email addresses and fax numbers are not accessible to other owners unless they're provided to fulfill notice requirements or the owner allows them, allows the association to provide them. No penalty if you inadvertently disclose. Contracts and bids, we're going to fly through certain contracts to be not to be fully performed for within a year or for providing services. All must be in writing. Uh, you need to get bids if the aggregate cost exceeds 10% of your annual budget, unless it's for professional services. Uh, a contract with a manager may be made for up to three years. We're not going to go through the rest of this and candidly. Um, you know, if, if you're trying to figure out what bids you need, contact your attorney. Communication services, you can all read through. Um, let's see, other providers. Assessments. So bottom line, there is a new invoice delivery method as of July 2021, and you need to get the member's approval if you want to change how you're actually delivering those annual notices of what the assessments are and, and how they can be paid. Um, you have several pre-suit notice requirements. This new one, effective July 1st, 2021, is a 30-day letter, and it's called the Notice of Late Assessment. You basically are saying, here's what you owe if you don't pay it in 30 days. We'll go ahead and send this over to our attorney. You can't charge attorney's fees for this one. Uh, it just gets sent by regular mail. Then you've got a notice of intent to file a claim of lien, a claim of lien, and a notice of intent to foreclose. The lien is the document that gets recorded in the county public records. The intent to lien is the document that says, if you don't pay within 45 days, we're going to record that lien. And again, it says what's owed. It gets sent in certain ways. Uh, and then you file your lien after that expires. And then you send your notice of intent to foreclose which is what's required before you can file your foreclosure lawsuit. Uh, interest and late fees are authorized if provided in the bylaws. Uh, don't charge interest on interest or late fees, only on assessments. You are automatically entitled to recover your attorney's fees and costs on unpaid assessments, whether you file suit or not under Florida law. You have to apply the payments first to interest, then administrative late fees if any, then the costs and attorney's fees and then to the assessment and restrictive endorsements, meaning I'm applying this and it's payment in full, they mean nothing under Florida law. Um, we don't really have time to go through, but you guys are welcome to review all of the rest of this. Frankly, I'm gonna have to skip through pretty much everything unless I see something that is absolutely crucial and I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention it. Uh, and hopefully there won't be anything. Insurance, uh, maintain adequate insurance. We don't know what adequate insurance is, but presumably it covers everything that you'll need. Um, make sure that you are aware whether you have a general liability policy or a an injury liability policy. That's an issue that just came up for me last week. Uh, if you are in a flood zone, which is basically all of Florida, get flood insurance, get your directors and officers liability insurance, uh, know about fidelity bonds and ask your attorney. The Fair Housing Act, this is a really good um, outline of what you can and can't do. But as soon as someone asks about an accommodation of your rules due to a disability, 
immediately contact your attorney and have another one of those policies for how the association even asks the initial questions, okay? Don't just presume that you're gonna do it right because the Americans with Disabilities Act and Fair Housing Act, which are the acts that govern these issues, basically say you can't get your fees and costs back in a lawsuit involving this type of issue unless the lawsuit was filed in complete bad faith, meaning there was no basis to believe that the owner could have succeeded in that lawsuit. Then we've got recalls, which is basically a highly technical procedural matter whereby people try and pull others off the board. You can do it via written ballot by 10% of the voting interests, giving notice um, that's, that's at a member's meeting or by the written ballot, which is a majority of all voting interests, all signing documents, basically saying we want to remove this director or these directors and replace them with this director or these directors. Um, the board needs to certify the recall within five business days. So this is one where the second you get notice of a recall, um, send it to your attorney that minute, not even that day, that minute, stop whatever you're doing and get it over. Because I've seen this take up several attorneys time, especially in larger communities for entire days at a time. And when I say several, I mean, for one recall, I mean, like five, six attorneys and several paralegals for a couple of days on, you know, if, if there are, let's say four or 500 ballots, because you've only got those five days, five business days to get back with the board and make a decision and have a meeting. Um, so challenging uh, a board member who's recalled may file a petition challenging the validity that must be filed within 60 days after the recall is deemed certified. And it won't be accepted if there are 60 or fewer days until the next scheduled election. Okay, I skipped a bunch, but we made it to the end just at four o'clock. I'm going to stick around and I'm going to apologize to everyone that uh, that is is not going to see maybe the q and I don't know, Jeff, if you want to keep it running. Um, and, and I'm going to take, I don't know how many questions there were. I'm presuming there were, uh, let's see, well, 22 want, questions. What we can we'll do. see how quick I can fly through some of those, but I'm sure, Jeff, you've got some interim closing remarks. Is it appropriate for non-resident property owner investors investors to sit on an HOA board? And again, most of, a lot of these questions you're going to be able to answer by saying check your documents. So, and I get that, but some of these, and I didn't choose questions that are like novels. I mentioned at the beginning, please keep your questions short, sweet, and to the topic at hand today. So, Alan, uh, property investors uh, on the board, non-residents. Yeah, I mean, bottom line, it depends on your governing documents. So thanks for the answer, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> if your documents don't specify a non-member, a non-resident is not necessarily a non-member of your community. Someone that owns property within the community, if, whether they're an investor or not, is still a member of your community. Um, so if if it just says in your governing documents or it doesn't specify who can be a director. Check, chances are that individual can be a director, an officer, whatever. Um, it, again, it, it really comes down to your governing documents. Specifically, it's probably going to be your bylaws and what your bylaws say about the requirements to serve as a director. If those are silent on this issue, um, you know, the, the person can probably serve. The other thing to think about, if you're saying investor, I question whether you also mean a corporation, which might need to designate a particular member who is authorized to act on behalf of that corporation within the community. But again, that's also going to be only if your governing documents say that only they're only a, a person who has submitted a certificate uh, of, of authority from the corporation is authorized to act. Got it. Um, I added a little bit to this one because back in when I sat on the other side of the fence and uh, was part of a management team, this came up a lot. Do board meetings... Um, and in this case, HOA board meetings, do they have to be open and does do meetings have to be open and posted? In other words, is the entire community allowed to be a part of the board meeting? And the comment that I added is, um, can renters and guests enter the room where a board meeting is taking place? Because I uh, used to have a lot of uh, discussions about that. So the answer to the second part of your question is no, renters and guests generally don't have the right to attend those board meetings. Uh, but the answer to the first question is yes. Like I mentioned during the, the presentation, right. pretty much every member, and, and when I say pretty much, I mean every member is entitled to attend every board meeting. 
Now, the, the exceptions that I also mentioned during the presentation were if it's a privileged, closed legal meeting with right. your counsel to discuss potential or ongoing litigation, or if it's to discuss employment matters on behalf of the association. Those are the only two exceptions to the rule that says your meeting, your board meetings need to be open to the membership. Thanks for clarifying that. That comes up a lot, and I, uh, even though you covered it earlier. Um, do you have to have a fining committee? Is it mandatory in an Only HOA? If you want to fine. If you want to fine, then the answer is yes. And can it be, the other part of the question is, can, uh, can the entire committee be comprised of only board members or do you have to have other, other uh, association members on there? The committee needs to be comprised of non-board members is what I mentioned during the presentation. Um, so yes, you have to have other people and those other people can't be the family members within certain levels of, I hate to use the word consanguinity, but it's the shortest way to say it, uh, of, of those particular officers, directors, and managers. Okay. And this one also looks like it's going to be more of a clarification thing, because you did touch upon this about suspension of rights if uh, somebody hasn't cured or paid a violation at all or in time. Um, do uh, can uh, I'm trying to reword this question because it's, it's more of like a phrase here. But what are some what would be like a good example of a suspension? And like one of the questions, can you can you preclude, can you stop somebody from using private community streets? And I'm like, probably not is what I, I would that's, guess. But that's ingress or egress, which is something I mentioned, you can't preclude. Right. right. Like a, a popular example, um, something that we did back in the condo days uh, when, when I was there is that we. It didn't happen often, but one of the things we could do is not allow somebody to use the quick entry lane at the guard gate, make them make them wait an hour to get in. <laughs> so that, that's exactly something what I mentioned. But again, yeah. that doing that is an option, but it's a risky one because I've seen I've seen judges go either way on that issue as to whether or not that is precluding one method of getting in and out or precluding getting in and out. Mm -hmm. I think it's ridiculous for a judge, frankly, to find that that is keeping someone from getting into their community. We're not saying we're not letting you in. We're saying you have to go through the gate like every other, excuse me, but every other schmo that comes into our neighborhood. <laughs> um, and again, if some of these are repetitive, I apologize. Keeping not track right. of all of these questions or, or it's, it's not, not easy when you have uh, several of them there. Um, if proxies are only good for the meeting they were issued for, how is it that they could be good for 90 days after? It's not good for 90 days after. It's good for continuations, adjournments of that particular meeting. So it's not, well, you can vote for anything for me for 90 days. It's you can vote for me for these particular issues during this meeting. But if a quorum is not reached during that meeting the first time we try it and it gets adjourned and it gets reset for 60 days out and then we try it one more time 15 days later, it's still going to be good for those 75 days. It's not multiple meetings during 90 days or just a 90 day period. It's until that meeting is concluded okay. within the 90 days. Okay. Before I get to the next question here, uh, in the chat here, somebody mentioned, and this applies to anybody having the same issue. If you're unable to print your certificate now because you're on your phone, for instance, uh, will you be able to mail the slides and certificate uh, to a particular email address? Drop us an email at info at kbrlegal.com. Uh, please don't make that request into the chat. So if you have difficulties printing your certificates, uh, drop us an email. Again, info at kbrlegal.com. It's right on, uh, or you can, uh, yeah, it's right on the on the slide that Alan is sharing on the screen right now. And another thing you can do too is wait until tomorrow. You'll get the follow-up email to the email address you used when you registered for this event. So the same link for this evaluation will appear in your email address tomorrow, and then you can put yourself in front of a PC or, or a Mac or a, another computer to do that. Um, again, I'm going to skip a lot of these questions that really just uh, allude to just check what your documents say. Um, uh, kind of person, let's see here. Yeah, you've done enough of these to be the authority on whether the documents need to say Gosh, something. Gosh, yeah, I, I just need to get my, I need to pass the bar now. Uh, can a Q&A session occur after a meeting adjournment? And that's actually a pretty good question. That's something I would have asked because I run a lot of board meetings uh, in the evening on Zoom for some associations, um, strictly from a technical point of view. So I cannot offer an attorney's opinion, obviously. But um, a lot of these associations are doing Q&A sessions after the meeting adjournment. Is that okay to do? 
I'm not aware of anything that would prohibit it because you're not really making any decisions. You're just answering questions. As long as those questions and answers are not intended to impact a board decision that's being made, in which event you would be conducting association business and need a meeting, um, I don't really see any problem having it outside of a board meeting. The problem is you've still got, presumably, a quorum of directors convening which gives at least the appearance of impropriety if you're not doing it in an open meeting. So if you're shutting anyone out of that Q&A session or you're, you know, you're, you're doing it on Zoom and you know that there are a couple people, you know, for example, you had the meeting in person and then you do this on Zoom, that's what I would have a problem with is, is if you're not following your customary procedure and someone has indicated that they're not able to attend in the manner that you're holding the meeting, yeah. uh, but generally speaking, as long as you're not discussing things for the purpose of facilitating a board decision, I don't really see a problem with it. Yeah, that's such a touchy thing, too. You touched upon what what constitutes a meeting of the board, and it's, it's kind of frustrating. Uh, any interpretation is kind of frustrating because sometimes board members may want to get together to discuss a particular topic before they present it to the uh, to the to the owners, like for instance, uh, learning about the facts of building a new structure on the property. So I guess the difference is, as long as you're not voting on it and you're just discussing the the research to bring to everybody else, it's okay to meet as long as you're not actually making decisions. Correct. Correct. You're you're basically doing the initial review and trying to figure out is this even something that we want to consider voting on. Then once you've decided, okay, well, we've got enough information that at some point we need to discuss it and vote on it, then you have your board meeting and you actually have the open discussion. The other thing that that um, some attorneys recommend, not me, but it's an option, is email back and forth if, if it's purely a board discussion of do we even want to consider this option? Yeah. If it's a no, we won't even consider it. Well, you were never going to bring it before the members. You were never going to vote on it anyway. So for all intents and purposes, it might not matter if you ever have the discussion in open forum. Now, you might later have to explain why you never considered it. But, you know, unless someone questions that, it may not be an issue. Okay. And this one comes up a lot, even if you touched upon it a little bit earlier. So many folks uh, tend to confuse uh, rules and regulations with uh, official association documents, statutes, the whole nine yards. So do rules and regs need to be filed with the county? Because um, uh, according to this, the question here, the statute requires filing amendments. But what about the original adoption of rules and regs? Does that need to be filed? Or is that just something the community can do whenever they want uh, and whatever they want with them? Yeah. So like I mentioned during the presentation, the rules and regs are not part of the governing documents as the statute defines that term. And right. so amendments to them or the original don't technically need to be recorded. Now, I'd suggest that you record them anyway for the purpose of, like I said during the presentation, putting everyone in the world on notice. Because anything that's recorded, there is what's called constructive notice. In other words, you have the obligation to look into the county public records and see what might govern this community if you're considering buying a unit or a lot, or if you're considering renting. That's your responsibility. Whether most people actually comply with that responsibility is a totally different story. I fully acknowledge no one's running a title search before they rent their property. Yeah. It's not happening. But technically, that's your obligation under Florida law is to know everything that's in the county public records. So I would say record it is is my recommendation and send it out to all your members but technically sending it out to everyone after you've adopted it is probably sufficient is it fair to say that rules and regs are like clarifications of yes okay okay because they need to be supported by the initial the actual statutory governing documents if there's nothing in the declaration or bylaws that authorizes a particular rule it's probably not enforceable Got it. And I'm going to do one more. And then if you have any that you notice that you'd want to address, uh, the, the floor is yours 100%. But this one here kind of touches upon what you mentioned, mentioned earlier about board members actually being a resident. But this, this goes, uh, or being an owner, I should say, and actually living on the property. But this one takes it to another level uh, with an officer. Does a treasurer have to be an HOA board member? In other words, 
I guess the way I view this Does question, an officer need to be a director. Okay. Government documents. <laughs> but but like but a treasurer can turn like let's say the treasurer wants to can a board hire I don't know I'm making this up but tell me if I'm out of my mind or not an accounting firm that can give the re treasurer's report on behalf of the treasurer as long as the treasurer is at the meeting I've seen that actually happened am I making sense does that make you sense are, and and as a practical matter there are two different ways that you could handle that I wouldn't necessarily recommend having the treasurer's report be the the treasurer's responsibility I would include in the management contract or if you hire an accountant that isn't managing the rest of the community just the finances you know have have that contract say part of that individual's responsibility is either preparing records in a way that that treasurer can easily read and explain to the members or personally attend each board meeting and member meeting where that treasurer would make a report so yes i mean to to go back to what you were saying i think that's exactly the way to do it just make sure that the contract calls for that person to take on whatever responsibilities the treasurer would have had under the bylaws. Got it. Well, thanks for that. Um, do you have any closing remarks or any questions that you want to take from the Q&A? I think we covered most of the general questions. Some of the other ones are very, very, or more specific, uh, lengthy. And I know we have a show to get ready for in about a half an hour. Sure. Now, one of the good questions that I see right here is, um, does this meeting, meaning this this course, have to be an open posted meeting? In other words, is the entire community allowed to be part of the meeting? Well, they're allowed to be part of it because we allow them to be part of it as the law firm putting this program on. But it is not a meeting of the board because you're not conducting association business. You're not deciding on association issues. You're not getting guidance for your community. It, it's an educational course. It's not a board meeting, even if a quorum of your directors happens to be present. So I just wanted to clarify that one because it is something that routinely comes up when when uh, directors are nervous about attending some of these classes. This is not a board meeting because you're not even speaking. So you can't be conducting association business and it can't be a board meeting under the statute. Cool. That's actually one of the ones I addressed earlier, but I it's funny how uh, we, we I assume she was talking about board meetings because that question came up when you were talking about board meetings in the presentation so uh i took that same question that's the one where i changed the words a little bit about uh, okay. the board meetings have to be open but i'm glad you did that because she might have the wording, something but you changed the question but i'm glad we answered it both ways you are the man thank you you got anything else no i i just want to thank everyone especially the ones that stuck around for an extra 20 minutes this is uh I, I texted you while you were speaking, Jeff, that frankly, putting all of this into two hours, um, I don't know that it's feasible unless I cut out all of the personal commentary, but uh, it's it's not an easy thing to do in two hours. And I really appreciate everyone that really stuck around. And I hope that everyone got a lot out of it. And uh, I welcome anyone that's not a current client to reach out to me if you want and or or just on your survey, Mark, that you'd like to be contacted. If so, I'll be the one that does it. Oh, okay. Oh, and Rebecca, see, she actually had this in there and I I missed it. She said, to clarify by meeting, I meant a hearing for the fine, but I guess so a fining committee. Ah, okay. <laughs> I missed it too then. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. I'm, our folks are such great listeners. So thank you for the questions. Thanks for joining us today. We know you have other options again.